If you ever want to travel to Leeds, there is a section that, unless you know the line, takes you a little bit by surprise. After heading over the Arthrington Viaduct, taking in the stunning views of the Wharf Valley, the line heads into the darkness of the Bramhope Tunnel. It was the height of railway mania. George Hudson was in his height of his railway prime and lord of all the lines, with the other railways desperately trying to keep up. In 1840, the local Leeds manufacturers were horrified to discover that the main line from Leeds to Selby was leased, then purchased by the York and Morfe Midland Railway. The Leeds and Selby Railway offered a direct route to Leeds, but Hudson had his own route via Castleford. Despite Hudson's line being four miles longer than the Leeds to Selby line, he closed the shorter route to all passengers west of Milford meaning that passengers had no choice but to use Hudson's line. The manufacturers knew that not only would they have to pay a man they openly despised for their goods getting out of Leeds, that it would only be a matter of time before freight was banned as well, leaving either Hudson or the canal network. What the manufacturers needed was a railway that could stand up to Hudson and give unfettered access to their city and beyond. The Leeds and Thirsk Railway stepped up to the plate. They were desperate to move in on the north and under Hudson's nose. The plan was to build a line from Leeds to Thirsk via the town of Harrogate. Harrogate was becoming a bit of a tourist hotspot. The spring waters that were found in previous centuries were thought to be having medicinal properties and people needed reliable transport to the town to help treat a variety of ailments. Now there's only one thing that to be said really about the sulphur water in particular. If you dare to try it, be prepared. The stench is nothing compared to its taste. How people used to drink it by the pint takes a special type of stomach. If you just want to smell it, at the Pump Room Museum there is a tap with a push button that taps directly into the well itself. But be warned, if you do press the button, you'll almost likely clear the street. There were also other advantages too. The Vale of Wharfdale had been untapped and a building a railway across the north would open up Leeds to the northeast. Particularly handy as Leeds at the time had one of the fastest growing collection of steam engine producing factories in the world. The proposed line would have a station just outside of Harrogate in the town of Starbeck. The new line would face many different obstacles, including the building of a 21-arch, 460-metre viaduct. But the biggest challenge would be from getting from Horsforth to Arthrington. Now, they couldn't go above as Bramhope Village was stuck in the way. Now, the only way for the railway to get connected would be a tunnel. The railway hired Thomas Granger as the main engineer and James Bray as the contractor. The original plan was to have the tunnel length set at 3,344 yards, but after a conflict with a local landowner and issues with water, the tunnel plans were stretched to 3,743 yards. To keep the tunnel on course, two 40-foot towers were constructed. These were used to view the hill and with it the boring shafts. This meant the line between them would be as true and straight as possible. To make the shafts, the men would dig down using picks and shovels. Each shaft was only 10 foot in diameter and was brick lined to help shore up the walls. When the light faded, the men worked by candlelight. And when the men hit bedrock or large stones, explosives were used to help clear the path. As with many large projects, the project was undertaken by the navvies. 2,300 men brought their families to the hill to live at the site of the works. To accommodate them, 200 wooden huts were built so that up to 17 people at a time could live there. The work was backbreaking. There was nothing in the way of health and safety and the company used a box and cock style to running of the site. As one man left his bed to start his shift, another man who had finished it would take it. Work on the tunnel literally never stopped. Near to the huts where the men slept, there was a fully working mini industrial town full of stonemasons, blacksmiths, offices and stables for the 400 horses on site. Coal stores, explosive stores and joiner shop also littered the site, with all of them going day and night with little to no sanitation and basic amenities. 
the sight would have been deplorable. Away from the huts, the site where the men were digging was not much better. The conditions were wet and coming from the area myself, I can say firsthand that even in summer, up on that hill, if you're wet, they would have been freezing. The water drained from the ridges of the hill into the tunnel, soaking the workers, even if it wasn't raining. The problem of water draining was so bad that the locals took the railways to court for affecting their water table. It was estimated at one point over 4,000 gallons were being pumped out of the tunnel to the minute. The men were malnourished, tired, overworked and constantly soaked. Disease was quick to follow. Pneumonia influenza went rampant through the camps and contributed to 10% of all camp deaths. To shore up the walls, the tunnel firstly was sealed by 8 inch coarse blocks with Roman concrete. The concrete was perfect for the conditions as it would get stronger over time and is known to be resistant to water. Then the blocks would be backed by clay and rubble and then finally covered by ringed brickwork, again adding strength. The two ends of the tunnel are polar opposites to each other. The south tunnel entrance, simple enough and basic. But the north portal had a makeover never seen on tunnels before. The north entrance was made to look like turrets of a castle. In fact, it was actually working offices for a railway at a time. Weirdly, it really works. Not far from the tunnel is the estate of Harewood and the ruins of Harewood Castle, coupled with the ruins of Knaresborough Castle, nearly 15 miles away. Kind of easy to see the inspiration. The tunnel was completed in November 1848 and the first train went through the tunnel the following May. As the tunnel was finished, the navvies moved on, but not before sealing all but four of the tunnel shafts. The four open tunnels would act as vents, removing ash and steam. Only one engine was allowed in at a time, but after a while a second line was placed and the two engines were running without incident. Officially, 24 men perished in the wake of the tunnel's construction. The majority passed due to illness thanks to the working conditions, but many succumbed to sudden flooding or cave-ins. It has been speculated that the toll was much higher, but like with many historical records, it is likely the numbers passed were doctored. In an unusual twist, however, James Bray wanted to acknowledge the deceased men. He didn't have to, but what he built was stunning. In the nearby Otley Church, Bray built an elaborate memorial with a miniature reproduction of the castleized North Portal. The memorial was both dedicated and served as a grave marker for the lost men. Another memorial was a grave marker to the name of James Myers. Myers was just 22 when he died in the tunnel. Tragically, his three-year-old daughter was buried with him, having passed just weeks later. Out of the tragedy of the Navi's conditions, there was some hope. Local Elizabeth Garner was the daughter of the Vicar of Otley. She was an only child when the Navi's were building the tunnel, but she remembered it well. She remembered that she would be threatened that she would be taken away by the Navi's if she was naughty, and the locals were openly hostile to the new people, even going as far as the police patrolling the site specifically. She couldn't understand the prejudice, especially as many of the navvies would go to the church her father oversaw. She also heard about the conditions they were living in and campaigned for better working and living conditions. Her voice was heard, but sadly credit was given to Reverend Lewis Mole. The line was completed and things have run smoothly for many, many years. Drainage has improved drastically, although the tunnel is prone to the odd flood or two in extreme conditions. The line itself, though, has changed around it. At the time of the tunnel's completion, the Crimple Viaduct was also completed. This was George's answer to reaching Harrogate and towered over the Thirsk and Leeds line. The viaduct took the train to the station at Harrogate, Brunswick, which barely lasted 14 years before it was demolished and the new station opened. The Leeds and Thirsk Railway did eventually end up merging into the York and North Midland Railway, but by then Hudson had long been since deposed and his deceit was found. Today the tunnel stands strong and although most of the line is gone, you can still see remnants of it. The embankment can easily be seen from the Crimple Viaduct 
and you can even walk part of the old line. Starbeck Station hasn't moved, although it has changed quite a bit. Um, but there is the old Star Inn, now separated and converted into private dwellings and shops, and the old railway houses and the signal box is still in use. The tunnel, though, fascinates me. Sadly, you can't get into the North Tunnel offices, but you can get to the vents, and there's even a sightline tower still standing. The tunnel now serves over 130 trains a day at over 60 miles an hour. It's not bad for a structure really 175 years old.